Thanks, Andy. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Karthik Raghunathan, and uh, this is Arashi Raghuvanshi. Uh, we are both part of the WebEx Intelligence Group at Cisco. Uh, this is the group that works on building uh, machine learning-driven uh, intelligent experiences for all of Cisco's uh, WebEx portfolio of collaboration products. Um, we are both really excited to be here as part of the Computer Systems Colloquium. Um, it, this is a uh, this is a course that I myself took in my very first quarter here as a, a Stanford master's student about a decade ago, and I think it was uh, pretty useful for me to just get the breadth of all the different leading challenges in the industry, and it helped me put my academics in perspective. So I'm uh, really happy to be back here after about uh, 10 years and sharing like some of our industry learnings uh, with all of you. Uh, so the, the talk today is uh, about building uh, enterprise-level uh, conversational interfaces. And uh, at a high level, the talk is structured into two main parts. I'll be beginning with an overview of uh, what WebEx Intelligence is, which is the initiative that Arushi and I are a part of. Uh, and this would mainly just to be uh, for setting the stage for the rest of the talk. Once we have given you some background about the kind of products we are trying to build, We'll, uh, re the remainder of the talk will just be a technical deep dive into some of the practical problems we are solving, specifically in the area of uh, conversational AI. Uh, so we'll go over various natural language processing techniques for building uh, conversational interfaces for the, interfa uh, for the enterprise. Uh, we'll talk about how do you go about doing uh, training data collection for training your uh, statistical natural language processing models. Uh, how do you build the end-to-end -end application and then uh, we'll also touch upon how can you improve your machine learning models over time and thereby improve the application over time as more and more users uh, use your system. Uh, by the end of the talk, uh, we uh, hope to give everyone uh, a good overview and a good understanding of what it takes to build uh, fairly complex conversational systems like the, personal, the various personal assistants that uh, are popular on the market today. And we also hope to be able to give a better appreciation for some of the challenges that uh, these kind of systems uh, have to face, especially when dealing with voice inputs. All right, uh, so let me just uh, start with a very quick introduction about WebEx Intelligence. Uh, so my alternate top, my alternate title for this section would have been, really, Cisco works on AI? Because this is something that seems to surprise a lot of people. And uh, given Cisco's roots, which can actually be traced back to the Stanford campus, uh, it's not a big surprise that most people still associate Cisco as just a networking hardware company. Uh, most people don't even think that Cisco does anything in the software space, let alone anything to do with machine learning or AI. Uh, but in reality, Cisco makes a fair chunk of its revenue from selling software to enterprise customers the most popular of which is uh, their collaboration products that it sells under the WebEx brand name. Uh, some of you may have already used WebEx, uh, most likely the WebEx meetings application that uh, people use for hosting and conducting online meetings, but WebEx also has solutions for messaging, calling, and various forms of uh, video conferencing. So from the kind of the Cisco desk phone in the White House to the really large telepresence devices in the corporate boardrooms of various Fortune 500 companies and everything in between, there are many millions of people who use, who use Cisco's collaboration products on a daily basis. And what we as the WebEx Intelligence Group are trying to do is figuring out how we can leverage AI to, uh, in general, yeah, make the lives of all our users better and make them a lot more productive as they use the WebEx, WebEx portfolio of products. A lot of the day-to-day -day collaboration these days, both uh, within teams and across teams, happens within meetings. And we envision that using AI, we can make this experience much better for all of our users like before, during, and after the meetings. So for instance, we could uh, help our users figure out who are the right people, who are the right set of participants or subject matter experts in the company to even invite to a meeting to have a fruitful discussion on a specific topic. Uh, we could make sure that we can automatically find the time and uh, schedule the meeting for them, for finding a time that's uh, convenient for all the different participants. 
Uh, in advance of the meeting, we could also send them some sort of uh, pre-briefing notes, which could be useful for them to be better prepared and have a more productive meeting. Uh, during the course of the meeting, we can uh, use AI techniques to make sure that the meeting uh, goes in the most uh, smoothest and seamless way possible. We could possibly also use AI to replace some of the work that distracts humans in meetings today, such as note taking or other kinds of bookkeeping. And finally, once the meeting is done, we could uh, leverage AI technologies to uh, do things like automatically generating uh, meeting transcripts, uh, minutes of the meeting, summaries, uh, action items, and then send it to all the participants so everyone is on the same page on what the next steps are, what the follow-up actions are, and so on. Uh, some of these capabilities are uh, already achievable today with a fairly reliable accuracy. Uh, some other capabilities work, but they work well only in some, some sort of ideal conditions. But uh, just given the rapid uh, pace of progress in machine learning and associated applied fields like speech recognition, natural language processing, and computer vision, I think it's only a matter of time before a lot of these capabilities uh, become a widespread reality. Um, and just to drive that point home, point home, I want to give a few examples of some machine learning based applications that are already successful in production today. So at this moment, we have fairly good uh, complex computer vision models, which do a really good job at face detection. They are fairly robust, and they can detect faces of uh, different kinds, different complexions, sizes, in different environments. So whether it's a very small conference room or a large auditorium like this one, they do a very good job of detecting all the faces in the given image or the given video stream. Uh, we can, yeah. Can you do it in profile? Can you do it in? Can you do a face detection in profile? In? Somebody turns his head, yeah. Oh. Uh, so for the, uh, so you, you would have had to have at least seen the camera head on once, and then we can do uh, object detection and person tracking to make sure it's the same person. Okay, but so you're doing GIFs. Yeah, okay. but if you always were in the meeting not showing your face, then it would be difficult to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so the face detection models help us to yeah figure out. Uh, do some certain sort of uh, runs, uh, conference room analytics so we can figure out for any given meeting what are the number of participants who have who joined in from different locations. Uh, we also use uh, face detection for uh, doing uh, intelligent framing, so which means we try to crop and zoom into the relevant portions of the room so that we can get the best, uh, best sort of image uh, and that in general enhances the video calling experience. Uh, similarly, we also leverage uh, audio triangulation techniques uh, in conjunction with the microphone arrays to figure out where the primary source of audio in the room is coming from. That allows us to know who the active speaker is and then make sure that the active speaker is again tracked in every frame of the image. We also have models for face recognition, which is slightly different than face detection in the sense that in addition to detecting the faces, it's also classifying those faces and assigning a name label to each one of them. So it can do a lookup uh, against a trained set of uh, uh, person names from the company directory and assign a name to all the faces that it detects in the meeting. And you can uh, foresee this being really useful uh, for scenarios where you are meeting with a set of people for the very first time, so you uh, already know who each person is. Um, so yeah, I think dealing, dealing with background noise and uh, ensuring the crispest audio quality possible is, is a problem that uh, all online meeting software have to deal with. Uh, and while there's a lot of audio processing techniques you can use for doing things like um, echo cancellation, canceling reverberation, and attenuating background noise, it, it's, it is still a challenging problem to solve when Let's say you have a user who has dialed into the conference room and, and has forgotten to put himself on mute, and then some of the inadvertent noises that come from him uh, disturb the whole, all the other uh, users. Uh, but we have been, in the past, been able to solve this with some amount of success by training a supervised uh, deep neural network, which is able to distinguish uh, human voices from other kinds of noises, such as uh, the noise made from keyboard, keyboard taps or the noise of a dog barking or a baby crying in the background. So anytime our classifier detects any of those non-human voices 
coming from a user, we can now tell the user that, hey, I just alert them that we are detecting a lot of disturbing noise from your, uh, from your machine. You, you may want to put yourself on mute. Or we might also be able to use this to just automatically kind of uh, uh, lower down the volume for that user. So um, yeah, as you can see, there's like many different varied applications of machine learning just within the collaboration domain. Uh, but the topic that uh, Arushi and I are mainly going to be focusing on today is a natural language understanding for conversational assistance. And the reason uh, this is a uh, topic uh, or this is an area that Arushi and I have been working fairly closely on for the past couple of years. And uh, one of the reasons that this topic is really exciting to us is that it's increasingly becoming clear that conversational interfaces are the next frontier. Uh, back in 2016, uh, Google uh, published a report saying that almost 20% of all the searches it gets are voice searches. And then uh, Comscore, uh, a leading web analytics firm, also mentioned that by the end of next year, they expect almost half of all the web searches to be initiated via voice. Uh, one other reason for the proliferation, uh, one other reason for uh, yeah, just the shift in user behavior is the proliferation of connected smart devices. Uh, so now I think uh, almost 25% uh, of all households in the US have a voice-enabled uh, smart speaker like uh, Google Home or the Amazon Echo, and that number is steadily rising. Uh, so while uh, we do see the adoption of uh, conversational interfaces uh, go up in both uh, in home and uh, even in cars. The one place which has generally been left out of the whole conversational AI revolution is the workplace. And this is the thing that we at Cisco are trying to solve by uh, trying to build uh, an assistant that we are calling the WebEx assistant, which is, more fo which is a new kind of assistant focused merely on work use cases. So this is a, it's a first of its kind enterprise fo focused assistant focused to just help you get work done in a more efficient way. So that means that you may not be able to ask this assistant to sing a song or tell you a joke, but uh, if you want to get things done, like if you want to uh, join a meeting or schedule a meeting or contact someone in the company or you want to share some files with them or in general collaborate, collaborate more efficiently with your colleagues, this is something that uh, this voice assistant will enable to, uh, you to do a lot more efficiently and seamlessly than before. So while we would have uh, loved to do a live demo of the WebEx assistant, uh, uh, one of the issues with that is that the WebEx assistant, unlike uh, the Google assistant or Siri or Cortana, doesn't actually live on a mobile phone, uh, at least not yet. Right now, this is an assistant that resides in Cisco's uh, video conferencing devices, like the device shown there. So, and it's difficult for us to haul one of those big devices here to do a demo. Uh, but I do have uh, some screenshots just, and that I can walk through just to give people a, just a little bit of a glimpse into what the user experience would look like. So when you walk up to a video conferencing unit, the user interface should resemble, uh, yeah, should look some, something like this. And then just as with any other wise assistant, there is usually a wake word to invoke it, uh, which in our case, the wake phrase is OK WebEx. So the moment you say OK WebEx, that puts the system into this listening mode where it's waiting for the user to speak his uh, next voice command. At this point, I could say something like call Barbara. And then uh, the system takes this voice command. It tries to interpret it using uh, natural language processing in the back end. And then uh, it understands that uh, the user is trying to call a person in the uh, company directory. And then it uh, fetches the most relevant set of results back to the user, which will be showed in a kind of a results carousel like this. So here, uh, if I have already found the user or already found the colleague that I was looking for, I could go ahead and make the selection. But if I was uh, not satisfied with the first four set of results, I could say something like show more. And that would just uh, show me the next page of results. And so you could similarly uh, expect like you could keep saying show more or go back and you could, just as you navigate search results on a web page, you could uh, navigate through, through this uh, list of results. So I could do this over and over again till I actually find the person I'm interested in and then make the selection by saying something like option 22. 
Um, alternatively, I could have made the same selection by um, just saying out the full name, like I could have just said Barbara Olga, or I could have said uh, used, used her title and said something like uh, Barbara the director. So anything that helps the system to distinguish between the different options being presented. Uh, so regardless of the way I make the selection, what the system would then do is go ahead and actually make the call to the person, and then we can get our meeting started. Uh, so this actually was a little bit of a contrived example just to uh, show you what the user experience looks like. But in reality, you would never actually have to go all the way to option 22 because the way our system works is it, uh, it understands the user and tries to uh, cater the search results to the user. So it knows, it has some uh, notion of uh, the interaction is history of each user and like, how close is each user to other users or uh, other people, other colleagues in the company directory. So it uses that information to make sure that the people you are more likely to interact with are ranked way higher. So in most cases, you would find the person you are looking for right on the first page. So that was just a walkthrough of uh, one, one example use case that you could do with WebEx Assistant. But the Assistant is actually capable of handling uh, more than a, uh, upwards of 100 different user intents. And so what the rest of this talk is going to be is just going behind the scenes of how do you build a complex conversational assistant like this one or any of the other popular personal assistants on the market that you may be more familiar with. And so I'll uh, hand it over to Arashi for the rest of the talk. Thanks. Um, so as Karthik mentioned, I'll be talking about some of the challenges around and the solutions for building a production level conversational assistant. So building a truly good conversational assistant is one of today's hardest problems. As I'm sure a lot of you have experienced, some of today's chatbots can be fairly disappointing. You can say something like, call me an Uber, and the response will be something like, sorry, I don't have a contact for an Uber in my address book. Um, oftentimes, these voice assistants can misunderstand common slang, or they can seem to break when you go even slightly off script. In addition, even basic requests that should be handled by the assistant give the response of something like, sorry, I don't know how to help with that. On the other hand, in the acad yes. That raises two questions. Uh, is everything going to be in English? And second, what about accents? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, for the purpose of this talk, we're focusing on English language. Uh, conversational assistance, and um, yes, accents are a common problem in uh, speech recognition. But are you uh, and looking at other languages? Besides, what's the priority of your languages um, I guess right now, for the near term, we're focusing primarily only on English, but following that, uh, it'll be probably based more on the customers and what languages they have in their organizations. Right. I, I, it, it turns out that even just with English, we are finding that uh, the models that we work well for American English don't quite work well for our British customers or don't work quite well for our Indian customers, right? right? So even just within English, we are doing some tweaks for each locale. But then beyond that, I think we might mostly probably go to some European languages and then possibly Mandarin. But yeah, it would, like Arashi mentioned, determined by the kind of uh, yeah, customer uh, yeah, uh, feedback and what the demand is. So yeah, while uh, today's chatbots are a difficult problem, um, on, in the academic world, there's been a lot of relevant uh, progress with a growing number of publicly available data sets, as well as a lot of recent uh, relevant papers being published in areas like language modeling and dialogue systems, um, et cetera. And furthermore, some of these papers have even reported near human accuracy on certain subtasks of question answering or reading comprehension. So with all of these advancements in the academic space, why is it still such a difficult problem to build a high quality conversational assistant? And it comes down to a few things. One is that many of these published papers focus on just a single component of a larger problem. So it focuses just on reading comprehension or just on question answering. They don't tell you how to string together all of these components to, perform, uh, to create a full conversational app. Um, and as you are stringing together these different components, you get a sort of compounding error effect 
where if your reading comprehension module doesn't fully understand what the user is trying to say, it makes it very difficult for the question answer to then respond back with the uh, answer that the user is expecting. In addition, many of these papers are evaluated on standardized data sets, and it can be very difficult for you to build out a training data set that has the amount of data that exists in these standardized data sets. And so the state of the art models that work well on large training data sizes may not work well on your smaller data sets. Uh, in addition, the characteristics of these data sets may be different. Your real world data sets may have more noise or different types of noise than exists in the, the standardized data sets that these papers are being evaluated on. And so again, the state of the art models may not necessarily translate in accuracy to your specific use case. Yeah. Is anyone developing industry standard practices for selection of training data? Uh, yeah, so I guess that will be the next topic. Um, so there's started to become a consistent methodology that's emerging for building conversational assistance that yields good results. And this is kind of at a high level become an industry standard that most of the major players in the industry are using. And so the first step of that is data collection. Uh, the next step is a, the machine learning models and the pipelines to actually build the application. And the third is uh, the concept of ongoing model improvement. How do you continually improve your models over time? So with the first step of data collection, uh, the first thing to think about is um, selecting the right use case. So as you narrow down the domain of your use case, you can achieve higher accuracy more easily because you can focus in on domain-specific knowledge and vocabulary. However, you also need your use case to be broad enough that it's useful to the user and it simulates kind of a real-world human interaction. So selecting the right use case is finding those cases that are both high accuracy and strong value proposition. Um, so the first set of data to be collected is domain-specific metadata. So there's three subcategories of this. The first is domain-specific vocabulary. So if we take the Starbucks coffee ordering use case as an example, some of the domain-specific vocabulary are things like frappuccino, macchiato, venti, words that are very common in this domain but very rare outside of it. Also, there's words like tall, which means something different in the Starbucks ordering domain than it does in general English language. And so by collecting large amounts of this domain vocabulary, you can tailor your models for the specific language um, data. The next category is uh, data for a structured knowledge base. Um, so this varies by use case, but it's essentially a structured data set of all of the domain world knowledge that you need to fulfill a user's request. So for the food ordering use case, this would be things like restaurant names, menus, um, dishes, uh, options, etc. And for like a music discovery use case, it would be stuff like uh, song titles, albums, artists. And a lot of this data is often either publicly available and can be scraped or it can be consolidated via some APIs or maybe already available internally within your organization, but it's generally something that you can compile um, programmatically from what's already existing. In addition to the structured database, in a lot of use cases, you may need to query against a live API rather than querying against something like the knowledge base, which is updated less frequently. So some examples of where you would need a live API are things like if you need to know the, what the weather is right now, or if you want to know what the inventory is for a specific product right now, or if you want to actually place a request, like placing an order at a restaurant. And these, again, are either publicly available, maybe available within your organization, or you could have some sort of partnership with another organization to have access to their APIs. And in addition to the domain metadata, you also need to co collect conversational data. So this is the actual natural language text of what a user would say. So 
something like, please schedule a call at 4 p.m. in Winterfell. Um, and in addition to the natural language text itself, you also need to collect labels for that text. So um, these labels are corresponding to the models that I'll talk about. But for instance, in this case, a label would be that this would be a schedule meeting type of request and that we need to know that 4 p.m. is a time and that Winterfell is a conference room name. And a lot of times this data, unlike domain metadata, doesn't exist anywhere uh, already. So it's something that we leverage crowdsourcing tools like Amazon Mechanical Turk, Crowdflower, et cetera, to generate both the natural language queries themselves as well as the annotations and labels for those queries. And it's important that the annotations for these queries are very clean because if you don't have the clean label data, even the most advanced machine learning models won't perform, won't perform well. So in order to ensure that these labels are clean, we can do some sort of sanity checks where we have multiple different uh, crowdsourced workers annotate the same queries and we only accept them if there's a certain level of agreement between those different annotations. How well does unsupervised learning work when you're putting together labels like this? Um, so uh, for unsupervised learning, uh, do you mean for generating the labels themselves or for training the full model? Yeah, generating the labels themselves, I guess. Yeah, so I, uh, when we do these sort of um, crowdsourcing tasks for initially developing the application, we have to bootstrap it with some uh, hand-labeled annotations, but once we have a model that's trained reasonably well, we can use the output of the model as a bootstrapped annotation and then have crowdsourced workers verify if that annotation is correct or incorrect rather than having to generate the labels from scratch. So um, in that sense, it can kind of speed up the process, but uh, we haven't done too much with purely unsupervised labeling. You've done pretty Right, okay. Cool. So once we've collected... Real human supervision. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. Um, so once we've collected the data, the next step is actually building the model. Um, so there's many components of building a conversational assistant that form a complex machine learning pipeline. So each one of these components is its own machine learning model that can be built leveraging open source toolkits like scikit-learn or TensorFlow. And at a high level, the natural language processor component is what extracts all of the important information from the query, like what is the user intending to do and what are the key words or phrases in that query that are needed to complete the request. Uh, and then the question answer and the dialogue manager then generate the response back to the user and complete any requested actions. And then if we are using a voice-based conversational assistant rather than a type or text-based one, we additionally need two components. The first is the automatic speech recognition component, which converts the audio into text. And then the text-to-speech component at the end, which synthesizes the response text back into speech. So now I'll walk through each of the components in the pipeline. So if you have a voice assistant, the first step is ASR, automatic speech recognition. And at, this in and of itself is a very complex problem. At a high level, the components are from the raw audio using acoustic features to extract some feature vectors. And then you have a phonetic model which uh, takes these acoustic features as input and outputs a sequence of characters which represents the sequence of phonemes in the audio. And then there's a language model which takes the sequence of phonetic sounds and outputs the actual understandable English language. And that takes into account uh, general English, English language st statistics on what words or phrases are most commonly said. So the cost of building an ASR system from scratch if you don't already have an in-house solution especially one that is better than third-party ASR systems that are publicly available is incredibly high. So in the interest, 
in the interest of time, if you're starting out to building an application and you don't already have an in-house system, it makes sense to at least initially start by leveraging a third-party ASR <coughs> system like Google ASR, Microsoft Speech Services, et cetera. And it's important to note that while all of these generic ASR systems have reportedly low word error rates on generic English language, um, about less than 6% on English voice search queries. When you get into the area of noisy environments, different accents like you mentioned, um, and uncommon terms like person names or other proper nouns and entities, the word error rate becomes significantly higher. So we found that in our data set, it goes up to almost 41%. And so it's important to keep this in mind in the rest of the pipeline. And I'll point out some of the uh, models in our pipeline where we uh, are focusing on making them robust to these sort of ASR errors. So now the first component of the natural language processing pipeline is the domain classifier. And so domain is a broad area of a uh, unique set of knowledge or vocabulary for example, sports is a domain, weather is a domain, music is a domain. And so the domain classifier uses features from the language of the query to classify an example into one of your predefined domains. So this domain classifier is a classification model. So you can use machine learning models like logistic regression, a support vector machine, SVM, decision tree, et cetera. And you can also use um, many different uh, language features like character engrams, word engrams, different orthographic features, gazetteer matches, et cetera. And it's also important to note that using these classic models work well for all training data set sizes, but as you get very large amounts of data, you can also consider using neural network-based approaches. Um, and so now to give, make this a little bit more concrete, uh, we're also gonna consider a specific example as we go through the pipeline. So this example is schedule a meeting with Janice from accounting from 11 a.m. to noon in Aquarello. And so from this input query text, we extract certain language fe features and the domain classifier is able to classify this as the meetings domain over one of the other domains of expense, procurement, or travel. Then the next component of the pipeline is the intent classifier. So within each domain, there's different intents of what the user may want to do. For example, in the food ordering domain, someone could be searching for a restaurant by name, or they could be trying to find a particular item on a menu, or they could be trying to complete an order or place a request. And so each of these different uh, intents is a, another classification model, which takes in the context of the current domain as well as the language features of the query to then classify your query into one of these predefined intents. Um, so the intent classifier is again a classification model and you can use the same sorts of models and features for the intent classifier. But it is useful to separate out the domain and intent classification into two models, two steps of the pipeline because you're able to get uh, have both of the models focus on different types of features in the query and you're able to get much higher accuracy by doing it as a two-step process rather than trying to classify across all domains and intents in a single step. And then back to our example, so now that we are in the meetings domain um, from the extracted features, we can then classify this as a schedule meeting intent within that domain. The next component is the entity recognizer. And the entity recognizer detects uh, certain keywords or phrases, which we call entities, uh, from the query. And the set of entities that you're considering important, again, varies by the domain and intent that you're looking at. So if you're considering the food ordering domain and the search restaurant intent, some of the entities that you want to extract are things like a restaurant name, a cuisine, a dish name, et cetera. And if you're in the movies domain and the find movie intent, 
some of the entity types you want to consider are a movie title, a genre name, a cast member, et cetera. And yeah, so this is a sequence tagging model. So you can use models like a maximum entropy, maximum entropy Markov model, a CRF, or an LSTM. And the types of features that you would use vary by the type of model that you're using, but you could use things like a bag of word, character engrams, gazetteer match for a classic model, or you could use character word embeddings for more of a recurrent neural network based approach. And back to our example, so now that we're in the meetings domain, schedule meeting intent, uh, we note that Janice is extracted as a person name entity. Accounting is a department. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so all these domains, these intents, these entity uh, classes and whatnot, they're all hand designed by domain experts, correct me if I'm wrong. And right. so is there like, how do you identify if you miss something and then add that back in? Do you have like some kind of process for that or is it just domain experts still? Right, yeah, so the, the question was um, if these domains, intents, and entities are all defined by domain experts, and that's correct. So the person who's developing the app and designing the app is the one who's selecting what are the do domains we want to consider, what are the intents we want to consider within that domain, and what are the entities for that intent that we want to consider. Um, and on top of that, uh, the other point was that how do you know if you missed something um, from your domain intent entity design and how do you add back that back in so uh, I guess in the development cycle uh, Engineers would try to do their best to handle all of the edge cases that you want to support But as you have your model deployed and in production if you notice from user logs that there are certain Types of things that people are trying to do that you don't currently support or handle you can then go back and update your application to handle those sorts of intents or entities as necessary. Yeah. Are the decisions irrevocable? If you get the domain wrong, the context is going to be wrong. Right. Uh, and if the two domains are sort of almost the same, you always pick the top one and don't consider the second one, or right. uh, are you saying, we failed, let's back up and make a decision somewhere upstream? Yeah. Um, so yeah, the question was that uh, if you get the wrong domain, you're kind of, the rest of the pipeline's messed up, so how do you deal with that? Um, and uh, if sometimes those domains can be related and close to each other. So in the design process, we try to define the domains and intents as very distinct language boundaries so that we don't get into this uh, situation very often where there's two domains which have a lot of overlapping language. Um, so we try to kind of avoid that problem in the design phase. However, if it does happen that the domain is misclassified, uh, the, uh, this current system that I'm talking about uh, will just not be able to recover from that. However, there are other systems uh, that we are considering that kind of can kind of do a backtracking approach where you get the best possible combination of all of the uh, classifications across domain intent entity instead of treating it as a hard decision from the beginning. Um, but yeah, for the purposes of this talk, if, if the domain classifier messes up, then uh, you won't be able to recover from that. Um, one more quick thing. So in like the domain class, for example, is none of the above an option. And how do you train for that? Because it, you, you probably have quite a hard time picking the outliers correctly, right? Right, yeah. So um, again, the question was, if is there a none of the above option for a domain? And yes, for most of our applications, we have a unsupported domain or unsupported intent to handle any queries that are not supported by our app current application design. Um, and uh, it can be uh, somewhat difficult to collect a huge set of negative samples in the unsupported space, but um, I think over time we've kind of generated a good data set since we've built applications for multiple different use cases, so we can use the training data for all of the different use cases and put that into our unsupported uh, intent or domain. Um, and also because there, uh, there are a lot of consumer voice assistants out there, and for enterprise use cases, we oftentimes don't want to support those consumer intents 
or domains, we can kind of consolidate all of the language around the consumer-facing domains and intents and also put that into our unsupported domains and intents. So just to clarify, you're not actually doing anomaly detection, you're just training on how to sample things to detect negative cases. Right, that's right. So yeah, we train on negative samples. So these questions about domains and like, that raises a question of, so do you guys have a control vocabulary or you, for training data and, and the like, or do you, I mean, how do you get additional context into the system? Control vocabulary or not? Um, yeah, so by controlled vocabulary, uh, do you mean we expect the user to say certain types of words and phrases? Yeah, just sort of at a start. Like, it, actually, 30 years ago, I had a, a personal data system organizer which was made by a whole companies, the Sharper Image, and it asked you to, to for instance, specify 10 digits and uh, for certain particular words. Didn't, it, didn't even involve a keyboard at all. And I, I had no problems so long as it recognized my voice because that's additional safety. You wouldn't recognize Martin's voice over here, for instance. Oh, good. To respond to the <laughs> word like. That's and that was 30 years ago. And have we, have we come much further than that? Um, yes, yeah, so I think. Um, so is the question is, are, are we able to use some of those additional contexts as well to further improve the accuracy? Or? Well, yeah, I think actually you have advantages when you use yeah. it. Right, so I think one of the reasons of having this sort of domain intent, uh, like a well-designed domain intent entity hierarchy is that that kind of helps your app to like put everything else into the negative unsupported intent and then really focus on like the control vocabulary around the use case that you're training this application for. That's also one of the reasons I think one of the things uh, Arushi mentioned that the data collection phase is in terms of selecting the right use case, we also make sure that the kind of use cases we are building a voice assistant for are broad enough that they are interesting to the consumer, but not way too broad enough that it just gets too confused and it's trying to uh, be an assistant for every possible use case, just all under one application. So is that a configuration setup thing? Somebody does it once at the beginning, or? Um, the kind of, the, the domains and the intents? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, uh, there is a one-time setup initially just to launch your like the V1 or V0.1 of your app, but then as you start monitoring user logs and as you figure out what, what are the different ways in which users are interacting with your system, you incrementally uh, broaden the scope of your uh, uh, function by maybe adding a one more entity or one more intent or one more domain. But yeah, we begin with a smaller limited scope and then expand as we see user behavior. Uh, yes, uh, so as I think that would especially be useful, maybe not so much for the natural language processing piece, but for the speech recognition piece, uh, improving the accuracy based on user personalization is, can be definitely be helpful. I think that's one thing that we aren't able to do a lot in our systems at Cisco because these are like enterprise systems and these are in a conference room, so literally anyone can walk into the conference room and start interacting with the system. But this is something that the personal voice assistants like Siri or Cortana do try to do. So they do have a personalized acoustic and language model that they try to build per user to slowly uh, adapt better to your voice. So over time, you should see your word error rates uh, slowly go down. Could it slowly adapt to the needs of the company in terms of what sort of meetings it sets up, it needs to set up? If there are common errors that it sees, could that happen just automatically over on the client end instead of... Uh, instead of um, I guess for now we haven't, uh, at least for a production level deployment, we haven't found of uh, any sort of really human, human out of the loop, like fully automated processes. We still do have some human supervision. Like we do use some techniques to, and uh, something that Arushi will talk about later in the talk of like automatically figuring out which kind of training samples make more sense in order to further improve your system, like using techniques like active learning. But just because it is a consumer facing end user facing product, there is at least like some amount of sanity checking that humans do to make sure that we are feeding the right kind of system to retrain the models. It's not completely hands-free from that sense. Um, cool. So, should we want to go back? 
can finish? Uh, yeah, so uh, the recognized entities are things like uh, person name for Janus, department for accounting, 11 a.m. and noon are time entities, and then Aquarello is a conference room entity. Um, and so following the entity recognition component, there is a role classification <coughs> component. And so the role classifier assigns a differentiating label or relation to entities when they may have different meanings depending on the context. So for example, in the schedule meeting intent, the time entity type may be a start time or an end time. And similarly, for a flight booking scenario, a location could be an origin or a destination. Um, and so in natural language understanding, there's a concept of semantic parsing, which is trying to understand the meaning of a query based on how the tokens are related to each other. So the top image is uh, an example of a full semantic parse. But in many practical situations, it can be high latency and cost effective to train a full semantic parser, and you often only really care about certain relation types. Um, so a very shallow form of semantic parsing uh, can be considered this role classifier, where we're just considering the quantity type and assigning that to the child entity of six. Um, or similarly, if you had a query like, I'll have the six ounce soda instead of I'll have six sodas, then in the first scenario, six would be have the type of size rather than quantity. And so this very simplified shallow semantic parsing uh, becomes a simple classification model, which can again be trained with a logistic regression, SVM, et cetera. Yes. <clears throat> Um, so as an end user, how do you signal that there was uh, a misinterpretation? Um, and I guess the, uh, when we get to kind of the end of this pipeline, there's a component, which is the dialogue manager, which generates the natural language response back to the user. And then if a follow-up query is something like, that wasn't right, or it's a request to uh, do the original thing the user had asked, then at that point, given the uh, current context that's stored in that module, as well as the extracted um, labels from the natural language processor pipeline, you can kind of correct and hopefully get the correct response in the follow-up query. How often does that happen to me? How easy is this? <laughs> so the question okay. was, how, how often okay. does that happen? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Secret, huh? Um, I guess we can answer it at a high level, right? I think it's like similar to all other, uh, it really depends, it varies from domain to domain and intent to intent. There are like certain intents, like if I were just were to say something like walk into a room and say, join my meeting or start the meeting, that almost works with 100% accuracy, unless like the person has a very, very, very thick accent or like there's a lot of background noise and if the speech recognition doesn't quite work. But for, in generally for, I guess, all of our domains or intents, you can either think of them as closed vocabulary domains or open voc vocabulary domains. So for all closed vocabulary domains and intents, our accuracies are nearing like the high in the high 90s. But it's the open vocabulary intents where you have a person's name or some sort of a named entity is where, yeah, it can kind of range all over the place. Uh, but yeah, we still strive to, before we try to put these things into production, we try to get it to at least like the low 90s or the high 80s as much as possible for a representative set of users. Minimize user frustration. User frustration, yeah. Um, so back to our example now, in the schedule meeting query, the time entities of 11 a.m. and noon can then be assigned the roles of start time and end time. Um, and then, the next component is entity resolution. So this is resolving certain uh, entity text that was in the user query to some canonical form. For example, if someone refers to San Francisco as SF, that needs to be resolved to the full form of San Francisco, California. Or if someone says lemon bread, but in the product catalog, it's something like ice lemon pound cake with some unique identifier, 
that resolution needs to happen so that you can actually place a request in API to place that, old, place that order. So the way entity resolution works is it's a text relevance information retrieval based approach which matches the text of the entity from the user query against a database which contains all of the official canonical values that are possible for that entity. Uh, yes? Is this the same as uh, stemming or is this a, a different stage? Uh, I guess this is different than stemming, but um, stemming can be used as a feature for doing entity resolution. So it's essentially resolving any way of referring to an entity to the canonical form. Um, so now for the entity uh, resolver, this is where we really have to be careful about being robust to ASR errors because entities are often the proper nouns or the uncommon vocabulary that is most often mistranscribed by speech recognition systems. For example, in the meeting room use case, if you say, can you connect me to Karen Prakash's room, that can be trans transcribed to something like, can you connect me to Corinne Prakash's room? And we found that oftentimes a lot of the context words are actually transcribed correctly because they're more generic English vocabulary. However, the entities themselves are very frequently mistranscribed. And now when you're correcting against these mistrans or when you're doing the entity resolution against these mistranscribed texts, you have to make sure that your resolver is robust to those errors. So how do we do that entity resolution? Um, we have a few broad categories of features that we use. The first is text-based features. And so with text features, we have fuzzy matching, which is normalization using character engrams and word engrams to do a fuzzy matching between the, the text and the canonical forms. And this takes into account minor spelling variations as well as typos if it's a text-based input. We also have um, what we call semantic synonym matching. And so we have a predefined set of semantic synonyms that exist in our database. Things like pasta with tomato sauce for spaghetti marinara. And so in, uh, in addition to matching uh, textually against the canonical values, we also match against these semantic synonyms as well as common nicknames and aliases. Then the second broad category is phonetic features. So this is what is essential for uh, voice-based inputs. Since we are using third-party ASR systems, we don't have access to the phonemes generated directly from the audio. So instead, we use uh, a few different approaches, including double metaphone and graphing to phoneme, to generate phonemes from the transcribed text. And so double metaphone and graphing to phoneme are two of these approaches. Double metaphone is a rules-based algorithmic approach which generates the phonemes and graphing to phoneme is a neural network sequence to sequence model which generates the phonemes. And because it is a difficult problem to correctly generate the phonemes from text because the same word may be trans, uh, spoken differently by different people. People may have different accents or just in different contexts. It may be pronounced differently. Um, by using multiple phonetic models, we can kind of have complementary effects of trying to cover more ground. And so both of these phonetic signals can be used against to match phonetically against all the canonical values and try to correct things that are transcribed to be textually different but phonetically similar, like the two top examples. In addition, a lot of ASR systems give you not just one transcript, but an NBEST list of transcripts. For example, if the user said, I want to talk with Sheetal, the NBEST transcripts may be something like, I want to talk with Sheetal, 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 etc. And in some cases, the correct name may actually exist in one of the lower rank transcripts. Um, and even if not, the taking into account the NBEST transcripts can give you a better phonetic sense of what was originally said in the audio. So one interesting example for this case is where the, uh, the name Didi is mistranscribed to a more popular name, Stevie. And so this is tricky because if someone had actually said Stevie, you don't want to mess up that transcription. But if someone said Didi and it's always mistranscribed to Stevie, you need some way of correcting for that. 
And if you take a look at the NBEST transcripts, if someone had actually said CV and you see that all N of the transcripts have something similar to CV, you can be more confident that they had said CV versus if the top transcript said CV and the remaining N transcripts all start with the D or have stuff that's more similar to DD, you can have a signal that maybe you want to correct this to a more unpopular name. In order to do NBEST, do you need some sort of metric? What kind of metric are you using? Uh, sorry. What do you mean by best? Oh, um, How do you measure best? So uh, third-party ASR systems give you a ranked list of N transcripts based on how they categorize it as best, which takes into account a combination of the phonetic model and the language model. But it's essentially a black box so to us. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Uh, oh, and standard then, information theory. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, just uh, one thing I wanted to point out on the slide was I think we probably switched the examples. So this is the grapheme to phoneme representation. This would be the double metaphone representation. Yeah. And then the third broad category of features is a personalization feature. So this varies by use case, but this is very important in getting as high accuracy. For example, for the call person use case, we can take into account the context of who is the person calling and who is the callee. So you can use things like the relationship between the caller and the callee based on their previous interaction history or how close they are in the organizational hierarchy. Whether you're on the same team or the same org, you're probably more likely to contact each other than someone who's in a completely different part of the organization. Um, similarly, for a food ordering use case, you could take into account a person's uh, order history, the popularity of a dish, or how close they are to the restaurant that the tr they're trying to order from, um, and so on. So these are just some numbers that show how important it is to take into account all these features. So this is on our very noisy data set that had a word error rate of almost 50%. Um, and when we use just textual features to do entity resolution on that, the, uh, the recall at one is very low with um, accuracy of 0.15. But when we take into account the phonetic features, the NBEST list, and the personalization features, it goes up to almost 75%. And also when we have the UI of a carousel where you can kind of scroll through and look at a few options, the usability becomes even better because you can, are even more likely to find the person you want in one of the ranked results. And so this, uh, this set of features transforms the app from being virtually unusable to reasonably intelligent. Um, so back to our scheduled meeting example, well, we have all of these entities and now the resolution component will resolve the text Janice to the full person name Janice Smith with an employee ID. Accounting is resolved to the full form of corporate accounting with the department ID. The times are resolved uh, with the time zone and Aquarella, the room name, is resolved to the full form of that room name. Um, now, the next component is a language parser, which does a form of entity grouping and groups together entities that are related to each other. So if you're placing an order at a restaurant and you're trying to order pizza, calzone, Diet Coke, Domino's, uh, you know that you want to group together the option of extra cheese with the dish that it's modifying, which would be pepperoni pizza. Or you want to group together the quantity too with the item that it's um, modifying, which in this case is Diet Cokes. Um, so the language parser is another form of shallow semantic parsing. So previously the role, lab role labeling was extracting just the quantity relation type, and now in this case, language parser is just extracting the relation groups of the head and the child entities without worrying about what the relation type is. So um, in this example, a bagel with butter and warm muffin. Bagel and butter are grouped together, and warm and muffin are grouped together. And in use cases where you want both the grouping as well as relation label, we can still use a combination of the role classifier and the language parser. So in this example, a bagel and two of the muffins, the entity or the language parser will give you two and muffins grouped together, and the previous step of the role classifier will also have the label of quantity under two. 
Um, but by decomposing this problem in this way, we're able to get much higher accuracy with uh, much more limited training data sizes. Um, so in this uh, scheduled meeting example, Janice Smith employee ID would be grouped together with the department corporate accounting because um, corporate accounting is modifying that person. And the rest of the entities are just their own entity groups. So up until this point, we've been extracting information and labels from the query. And now the remaining components are about generating the response and responding back to the user. So the question answer um, retrieves certain answer candidates from the knowledge base, which is what contains all of the structured real world knowledge associated with your domain. And in our example use case, the question answer would essentially have two calls to the knowledge base to get all of the needed metadata of the invitee, which is Janus, and the location, which is the room Aquarello. And then it would construct an API call to create an appointment with that invitee at that location and with the specified start and end times. Then the dialogue manager is what um, constructs the natural language response and directs the flow with the user. So in this case, it would um, generate a response like, your meeting with Janice has been scheduled for 11 a.m. today. Um, and then finally, the application manager is just an underlying layer that passes all of the information back and forth between each of these components. So it first receives the client request from the supported endpoint, it passes it through each of the components that we just talked about it, and then it will return the final response back to the user. Um, and then, again, if you are doing a voice-based application, you would have a final additional layer which does text-to-speech. And this synthesizes the text of the response back into speech. And, and for this case, for the, for the most part, third-party APIs work reasonably well. So that was a very high-level overview of all of the components needed to build a conversational application. Uh, and now I'll briefly talk about uh, some concepts around ongoing model improvement and how you can continue to improve your model once it's deployed and in production. Um, and this is actually a very key piece of most machine learning products because uh, once you have real user data, you can significantly improve your models. And this is how most industry leaders in the machine learning space have become industry leaders in that space. So um, we can use a, sorry. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you keep it down? Yeah, you too. <laughs> so we can use uh, what we call active learning. Yes. Um, and essentially what that means is uh, that we intelligently choose which data to select and annotate. Because in production, raw data, raw user logs are cheap. But still annotating that data is still very expensive. <clears throat> So we can use different metrics like model uncertainty to choose the queries that our model is currently most uncertain about and select those ones to uh, annotate and add back to our training data first. And so in this graph, we can see how well it works. And the, the bottom blue line is just randomly selected queries from logs that are annotated and added back to the training data versus the blue line is uh, queries that were selected based on this model uncertainty metric. And so you can see that in both cases, the accuracy overall improves, but it improves much more quickly if we're intelligently selecting which queries to add back to our training data. And then uh, we can, as we kind of briefly talked about before, create a sort of semi-automated pipeline in production to speed up the process of, uh, of selecting queries and adding them to the training data. So the way that this would work is that we have raw logs coming in from users which are going to some central data store. And then we use um, some active learning approach, some model uncertainty metrics to intelligently select the queries that we want to annotate. And then these queries um, are run through our current models to generate some bootstrapped annotations. And these bootstrapped annotations are sent to Mechanical Turk or other crowdsourcing workers to uh, either accept or reject the annotations or update the annotations and verify that they're correct so that uh, after this point we have clean verified annotations that we can add back to our training data. 
then we will automatically compute the test or validation accuracy. And if the accuracy increases, we can automatically add it to our production model and deploy that model. But if the accuracy decreases, this is where we want to go in and do some error analysis or model experimentation and see what's going wrong. And in some cases, this may also involve doing some additional feature engineering and trying to improve the model in other ways. And in addition to continually improving our training data set, we also want to continually add to our test data set so that we have a kind of a real metric of evaluation that's evaluating against what users are actually doing. So uh, this is similar to the previous pipeline where logs are coming into a data store, but now we want to randomly select queries instead of selecting them with some other approach so that we get an accurate distribution of what users are saying. But we can again do a bootstrap annotations and crowdsource labeling, uh, and then add those verified annotations back to our data store as test data. Yeah, that was a very brief overview of some of the concepts of why it's important to continually add data back to your models and how to do that. Um, overall, we've talked about uh, how there's been a massive shift in user behavior towards voice interfaces. And we've talked about the complex machine learning pipeline of how to build a production quality conversational assistant, which involves uh, good data collection the natural language processing pipeline, as well as question answering and dialogue management. And finally, it's important to note that these current best practices produce reliable results, even on limited training data. But as we start as a whole, as an industry, to get more and more conversational data, some of these practices may change and models will continue to improve and develop over time.